Over the previous part of the lecture, we looked at the different systems and we actually done a whistle-stop tour of almost 50 years of different information systems, starting from InfoTerra in uh, 1972 out of the Stockholm conference, all the way to modern citizen science applications of today. So now in the final part, we are going to try and pick up common themes and issues that are appearing within this area of environmental information and environmental information for the public. So the themes that we're going to look at are information and communication technologies and the role within that, the legal and regulatory instrument and how they play out, the business and civil society NGOs, charities, and so on, and how they play out within this area, the political context of environmental issue, control over data and access, and finally we look at digital divide, the social, the economics, and the technological barriers between people and information. So the first thing that we need to notice is the excitement of the new which is always appearing with technology and technology is always exciting. We've seen it actually with the case of InfoTerra uh, starting with it where the cost of each uh, query in the database was several hundred dollars while it was possible to actually produce a directory and just send it around the world maybe at a lower cost. And we continue to see it with the excitement of the new mobile apps. So, for example, the apps that coming out from the European Environment Agency in 2008 are shortly after smartphones are appearing in the market. The number of people that can actually use this technology is very small. And in finally, today we are seeing all sort of discourse about AI for Earth. So across the era, we are seeing excitement of how new technologies can be used for capturing and using environmental information, not always with clear understanding of how they should be used, or what's the benefit, or why an area of a, such an importance need to always use the latest technology. At at the same time, also within information and communication technology, we are seeing the importance of geographical information. So GIS it was important for uh, systems such as the GRID, the early system that we mentioned uh, in 1982 by the UN Environmental Program, the innovation by Friend of the Earth with Factory Watch, and in current systems that you get environment life, which is what the UN Environmental Program is using. We also see the constant need for update and rewrite software. So I've shown you different versions of even the same system. So the system from 1997 needed an update somewhere in 2005, six and then it needed another update today and in between probably they ha they've gone another to update which we never caught. Technologies change, the environment in which they operate change, and that means that the system itself need constant investment in order to remain functional. There is also the issue of usability and the ability of people to understand the information. We've seen it in the example from 1997, which is still there today, with the ability of throwing information as uh, files that, that basically you need to process with your spreadsheet. If you are a community organization, how do you make sense of it? Today, with the noise mapping, there is even an issue that if in the past there was this website that provided you the information, now all you get is uh, files in a GIS format 
which then you need to make sense of. There is also a somewhat an elephant in the room about the environmental impact of information and communication technology, which are so pervasive. The rapid technological change and, and fast hardware and software cycles do have environmental costs which are commonly ignored. They are, from time to time, they are being mentioned, but not that much. For example, the fact that uh, Silicon Valley is a spot where there is a huge of an environmental contamination as a result of the development of ICT is again something that most of us, because of the view of information and communication technology as clean, don't pay attention to. There are also high costs in maintenance and high cost of energy. The information doesn't appear all by itself. It's always operating within some sort of regulation and law. That's, we've seen it in the environmental democracy pillars about the rule of law and how to access it. Things are changing. Um, and for example, we have frameworks such as the uh, sustainable development goals, which we mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, but also directives such as the noise directives which dictate how and what information will be produced about noise or air quality which dictate exactly what kind of data will be collected. There are also issues about thinking of who is dealing with the information. So for example in the case of Europe we have the European Environment Agency. We mentioned it several times, but actually it's an interesting organization because it's completely focused on the coordination of environmental information and data between member states and other countries within the European region. And they are spending quite a lot of work on standardizing and allowing information to be shared. So for example, there is a special directive called INSPIRE that is dedicated to the management and matching of data across different countries, which actually is coming from environmental information as the excuse of why to do so. So not on the business side, but the environmental side. Another aspect that we need to notice is the uh, role of civil society and the role of businesses within that. Because of the requirement and the way that government are demanding environmental information of different sort, that creates a big market. And notice, for example, in uh, 2018, it was already recognized that we are talking about a market of almost four billion dollars of environmental monitoring and that is going to grow even further. There is a big business in that which is something that is influenced in different types of monitoring. So there is a market for example in the monitoring of data in carrying out environmental impact assessment in managing data or producing report and also in creating different solutions for it. For example, one company, Esri, for a very long time was controlling a very big part of the market in environmental applications. So the area of environmental information have its own political economy that we need to pay attention to. Civil society organizations have an interesting role to play within environmental information and sharing it from the role of friend of the earth, which we've seen in our example, but also if you'll recall, you've seen London 21, which was a charity created to uh, overlook the environmental activities of the Greater London Authority when it was created. And there are many others, for example, in the Aarhus Convention uh, that we mentioned about access to information. There is a spe specialist organization 
that is dedicated to work with the member states on those issues. So just like the other areas of environmental management, there is a special role for civil society organization. And the next topic that we need to pay attention to is the politics of uh, environmental information. So the access to uh, information is part of a wider discourse in environmental politics. So the campaign of Factory Watch was not just about freedom of information, it was also that once we know about the chemical releases from different factories, we can create local campaigns and address them. There is also control over data and access. For example, we, we seen the example of a global community monitor where communities collect air quality samples because the factories are not releasing the information. Another example is from the public laboratory of open science and technology, which created a method of balloon mapping of attaching a camera to a balloon and flying it over. And in the middle picture, you see a road that was built in an area of a Palestinian village in Jerusalem. And the ability of the people in the neighborhood to take a picture using a balloon and then going with it uh, to the uh, parliament in Israel and discuss it didn't change the plan, but did provide the ability to access the data and argue it in different ways. So if we go back and look at our uh, definition, at the principle 10 that uh, we mentioned several times, we actually can now notice something a bit strange about the order of things. And that's something that is important when we consider the role of environmental information in the whole story. If we would think about the three pillars, the participation in uh, decision making, which notice that it's mentioned in the first sentence, Actually, then the principle turn into access to information as the most important things. And that's somewhat odd because between access to information and opportunity to participation, maybe opportunity to participation should come first. But the point is that in environmental decision making, if you don't have access to the information, you cannot participate. And that's a structural issue with environmental decision making that we need to pay attention to. The final bit that we would look at is the issue of uh, technological changes and technological divides. So, for example, if we look at 1992 when the idea of uh, of principal ten and uh, ability to access to information was raised, mobile phone was available to only 5% of the population. Worldwide, there were only 10 million web users. Data was held by public authorities. There were no portals. There was no easy online mapping. There was no legal instrument in place. Today, uh, we have mobile phones with 95% of the population in the UK. We have 3.2 billion web users. We have open data and government portal. We have many easy to use online mapping tools and we have directives and rules from the Aarhus Convention to directives in the European Union to national laws. However, there are still problems in accessing information, and we can talk about persistent divides. So, for example, we can see that while in the 1990s the issue was access to PCs because they were so expensive, they were costing something in the range of uh, three and a half thousand pounds in today's money. But today we have the issue of use of smartphone and accessing smartphone. Also, if we look at the ability to access and use software, 
In the 1990s, it was WebGIS and the ability to integrate it. And you've seen the example that um, in, in many systems, you need to download open data and know what to do with it. If you're not a data scientist, you're just stuck with it. And it's very frequent to hear about uh, this infringement through the claim that next generation will know how to use it. I'm too old to learn. There is also network access. So if in the 1990s, people would not be able to access a lot of information because of the limited bandwidth and only university would have strong broadband links, Today, we still have people with limited data b uh, access on the mobile plans, and therefore they cannot access all the information. There are also issues about access to information. So if it was in the 1990s, we were talking about libraries and supply side website, website that just show you the information and expect you to make sense of it, we actually somewhat went down because today, only the data is available to uh, the uh, population and the expectation that you'll know what to do with the data. The ability to make sense of the information is something that remained the problem. We've seen some examples of information that has been released and then you see all kind of numbers of pollutant and you need to make sense of them. And we mentioned the issue that it's not in community language. There is the lack of attention to the age of people that are participate. Community activists are usually in the older age bracket when they want to do something with the information, while the people who are involved in tech development are frequently male in their 20s to 40s, and they don't pay attention to the needs of older users. And there are uh, also the whole issue of the legal instrument. They are there, but you need to know how to use them. And knowing about them is the first thing. And there is not always the awareness of that by different organizations.